welcome to Libromancy, a podcast about the magic of books. I am Josh, and today I'm going to be talking about Three Parts Dead, the first book in the craft sequence by Max Gladstone. So let's resurrect the magic of books. First off, let me just say in the non-spoiler, I love this book. This is such a fun book. It's super engaging. This is my second reread, at least, and there's so much more to catch. There's very well done foreshadowing. There's very well done plot. I feel like the pacing is on is good. You never feel like you're rushed from one spot to another just to wait and have time pass without seeing it. And I do have to say that Max Gladstone seems to be an expert wordsmith. He chooses the right words at the right time to convey a very deliberate and meaningful picture. I didn't feel like he ever wasted a word that he didn't need to be explaining or demonstrating something. So I really liked that. I liked that we get so much information into this world, and I never felt too info dumpy. There are some passages that could make you feel like they were an info dump, but everything is informing you without being overbearing. So I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed the world that Max Gladstone has built, a world of magic and power and deals. And those deals in are not just normal deals, but they've evolved to be like financial deals, but with magic as the, the backer instead of currency. And I thought that was a really good twist on the magic. It keeps it much more interesting and exciting. And using the power of starlight and will and magic to kind of form the basis of your magic system, I thought was really good as well. All right, I think I'm just going to move into the spoiler section because there is so much to talk about and so much good stuff. So we're gonna, I'm just going to start with our, our characters and I'm going to go through them and talk about them kind of as they regard to the plot. So we're going to start with Tara Abernathy. She is freshly graduated in a craft. She is actually thrown out of her school and, you know, lands on the ground. And it's a hidden school, which is just cool. Like a floating school that runs or that flies around, picks up students, and then teaches them craft and then sends them out into the world. Now, in the beginning, we don't know why she has been kicked out or graduated and kicked out at the same time. But she has. She goes home for a little while, kind of lives her own life, kind of falls back into the... Uh, the provincial life, and then they are attacked, and some of the guardsmen die, and she uses the craft to bring them back to life. And that is by far one of the coolest things we've seen, you know, especially in just the first little bit of this book. That she takes the starlight and she has a like a lightning knife basically, and she cuts into their mind and she takes out the parts that won't last because she doesn't have enough energy and power to completely bring them back because when you bring people back something is always lost and so she cuts out their emotions but she leaves the anger that they felt at dying and she leaves the self-preservation so they'll survive and they won't just destroy themselves and she sets the townsfolk as their her ally as their allies and the townspeople get all angry when they see that she's done this necromancy and it's like but that was cool showing us how this works, that to bring something back, you kind of have to cut it down and chop off the pieces that are extra. Then you can bring it back because you just don't have enough power. So luckily she is saved by Mrs. Kavarian, Elaine Kavarian, who is a lawyer at the firm, or a craft lawyer at the firm Kelathras Albrecht and Ao, Ao, and she offers her a job. Come with me, we're going to go resurrect a god. Now, just like foreshadowing from like that chapter to the next chapter is pretty amazing. So, oh, and I have to say, I'm sorry, I forgot this. What a way to start a book. You know, God wasn't answering tonight. And then you kind of go through and you learn a little bit more about what that entails. And then you see, and the flame, the ever burning flame was gone. And you're like, oh man, that's big. So, way the way to start a book. I loved it. So, Tara and Mrs. Kavarian kind of head off and are going to the city of Alt Kolum, where Kos the Ever-Burning lived. And unfortunately, he is the god that has died, and they are here on behalf of the church to kind of fight this 
court case out with somebody else representing the creditors saying we need him brought back to do this, this, and this. And Kavarian and Abernathy are trying to kind of bring him back more whole or more the way he was. And we learned that Miss Kavarian was here in the past and that she worked on justice. And that since then, she's apparently had a change of heart because she's like, I am not going to let them do the cost with what we did to, to Cyril or justice. So it's very cool. It's a very good opening. I loved it. Uh, the next person we meet, or is one of the people we meet, is Abelard, Abelard, and he is a cleric or a technician, novice technician in the clergy, and he's the one that found that God wasn't there and that God, the fire had gone out and that God was dead. I love that he is smoking constantly, you know, from end to end, and even when he's like, you know, well, God used to just take care of my lung sickness so I wouldn't get cancer or anything, but... You know, now God's dead, but I'm just going to keep smoking. I loved it. Abelard is such a fun character, such a simple but, like, pure faith. It was great. And this is spoilers for the whole book, but we are in the spoiler section, you know. How many hints does Max Gladstone give us that Koss is hiding in Abelard's cigarette? I don't know how many times he says, that as I was looking for it this time, this read through, I was like, oh, how many times he says, you know, and Abelard smoked a cigarette end to end, and he hadn't let the fire go out once. And, you know, you see it that his cigarette hurts the uh, the shadow creature inside the the clergy house, basically. And he doesn't think anything of it because, you know, it's, oh, fire, like, you know, fire hurt the shadow. And it's like, no, that was cost hiding in your cigarette. So I just, I loved him, his innocence, him going around when Kavarian is introducing him to the ever to the deathless kings because they are the creditors and they just if they know the cost is still alive and what's going on they'll support costs and help him out you know and she's going to introduce him she's like this is the we're gonna go meet the senior deathless king of this concern and his name is james and he's like james like that's his name and she's like well yeah like of course it is what else would his name be and she, he's like i thought it'd be something crazier or weirder and he's like well you know, he was a person, and still is a person, so just a skeleton person. And, oh, it was so funny, him interacting with them and meeting the Deathless Kings. And, oh, that's such a cool idea that the more you kind of magic you use, the more your body becomes in line with the stars and the earth. And you basically become like a starlight body and just a skeleton. And just a, an incredibly cool thing all around. And then we also have, of course, Cardinal Gustav, who's the cardinal, kind of running the church. Uh, a bad dude, but you know you don't really notice it until a little bit way of the way through the book. So he is the one who decided to not tell Cost that Cyril was alive. He let Cost the God think that she was dead and built a circle to stop her from contacting him. He was not happy. He would not be happy about that when he found out. So and then we're going to meet our creditor, the one fighting for the creditors. Alexander DeNovo. He is bad guy. Did a couple cool things, but he's pretty bad. He in the school, what we learned we learned that Tara got kicked out because she burnt down Alexander DeNovo's lab. And his lab was where he basically mind controlled his students into working for him. And the way he explained it was just so good where she was there one hour a week and then she was there two hours a week, two hours a day, and then she didn't feel good unless she was there six hours a day or eight hours a day. And then she, her friend died, just fell asleep and never woke up. And he, she was like, wow, this is killing us. Like, I have to stop this. And the school was like, yeah, it's okay. You know, he's leading the pioneer edge of this cool thing. And she's like, oh, that's not going to happen. I'm going to, you know, burn it down. And he is. Alexander, a seducer, trying to seduce everyone, mind control everyone, and he wants to become a god. And that was, it was cool. Just the the last climactic scene in the courtyard, in the court where they are. Let me talk about that for a minute. Going to court with the craft is basically fighting each other with the craft to prove that either, you know, this amount of power could have done this, and that's what killed Koss, or this is how it could have worked. And then they are fighting with the craft and show proving to the letter of the contracts, like, no, this is what happened, and this is this, and that's so cool. But they find that the reason that Cost the Everburning died 
is because he was secretly siphoning off his own power into concern into a concern or like a financial investment kind of thing to give Cyril her power back, some power, and that he could give it to her and they could share it and he could bring her back. And De Novo didn't want that. Cardinal Gustav didn't want that. Just, it was such a crazy scene where he's fighting over the the concern and he wants to become Cost the Everburning, but he would be an evil person, of course. Ah, there's just so much. I, I want to talk about it all, but I don't have time. So... I love that there's the flight of gargoyles and they accidentally kind of get in the middle of the murder investigation and Tara steals Shale's face. Shale's one of the gargoyles and she steals his face and, you know, she puts it on a little like wig mask or wig stand and then talks to him, tries to interrogate him and then, you know, eventually puts him back. But that's the imagination and the thoughts behind this were so cool. I remember the first time reading this, I was blown away by every curve. And even on this read-through, I've been blown away by almost every curve. And even though I knew they were all coming. So I loved you know, Alexander De Novo and Miss Kavarian, of course, were the ones who worked on Serral in the past. And they worked as the creditors in the past. And they, you know, basically changed her. They made her blind. They changed the black suits into the gargoyles guardians from them to black suits and he even talks about how he you know, made them dependent on a sick need instead of mutual love ah so cool so oh and then of course at the very end right before Koss is uh, resurrected by mrs Kavarian in the middle of the courtroom de novo has basically won he's beaten everybody and he's about to grab the concern and ascend and the word, you know, the text is, then 140 pounds of bony, high-velocity novice technician hit him in the small of the back. And it was just awesome. I just loved it. It was like, bam, there it goes. And he fights, and then, of course, Koss comes out and free him. They trap him, and they lock him away. What a good book. I just have nothing, nothing bad to say about this. It was quite a fun read. Let's go to the black suits for just a second. The idea of the black suits... And then being on like a perpetual high when they are connected. You know, you're a random citizen and you want to be the black suit. You kind of join up and then you give up part of your time. And you are basically controlled by like a computer. You're kind of like a like a finger of justice. And she says, go do this and you do that. And that was just so cool seeing that. And then near the end, knowing that like Kat, one of the characters we've kind of met, who's a, a black suit. And you can see that she is being like negatively affected by this is like, you know, these people should be freed because we just proved in court that they are, they are okay. And they didn't do anything wrong. You know, and she's able to kind of like find the loophole in justice that justice wouldn't be able to find because of how she's been changed. So it was awesome. I again, loved it all. And then near the end, Mrs. Kavarian's like, Hey Tara, let's go. We're, you know, on to our next case. And Tara's like, well, I'm going to stick around here and stop running from my, my decisions because I do things and then I run and leave the consequences behind. And Mrs. Kavarian's like, all right, well, I'll be back in, you know, three to six months and we'll see how you feel then. And you'll come with us. You'll come with me then most likely. And she's like, okay, well, see you then. And just so cool. And of course the very end, the one of the ending scenes where she actually ends up killing Alexander De Novo with his own beast. He created the shadow creature to, kind of control Cardinal Gustav a little bit in case Gustav betrayed him. And Mrs. Kavarian, Miss Kavarian, excuse me, had captured it earlier and released it inside of him because when he kissed her after he mind-controlled her again. I know, I'm throwing all these things at you, but I'm I'm hoping you've read the book by this point because otherwise it's not. (laughs) You're not going to understand. But during that kiss, she pushed his own creature back into him and then undid it, and so he died. And it was, you know, it ate him from the inside out, basically. That was so cool. Just the style and the planning of all of his characters that he had to do to make sure that this was going to be great. It's amazing. I am definitely looking forward to the next book. I'm super excited about it. So, you know, that's going to wrap up my discussion of Three Parts Dead. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks to David Hillowitz for the intro and outro music. Of course, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to thebromancypod at gmail.com. And 
I've put up a calendar on the website at libromancy.podbean.com showing what books are coming up next. So, you know, go check that out. You know, please like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. And remember to resurrect the magic of books. <laughs> <laughs>